Hello and welcome to the NDTV Dialogues. Half the world's population is voting this year, India of course in a few months and also the United States and the United Kingdom. Polls in the United Kingdom are giving the opposition Labour Party a winning lead after 14 years in the opposition. That's his record, those are his values, and that is exactly how he should be judged. Mr Speaker, in 2008 I was the Director of Public Prosecutions putting terrorists and murderers in jail. He, he was making millions betting on the misery of working people during the financial crisis. And in an outreach to build a new UK-India strategic partnership, are two of Labour's senior politicians, the Shadow Foreign Secretary, David Lammy, and the Shadow Business and Trade Secretary, Jonathan Reynolds. Thank you both very much for being on the NDTV Dialogues. Thank you. Ms. Lammy, so the timing of this visit is really interesting for us. We've got the elections uh, countdown here in India, and perhaps uh, polls in the UK by autumn or definitely by January next year. Why did you choose this time to come? You've talked about building a new UK-India strategic partnership. Labour has a proposal for that. Why do you think this was the right time? Well, look, the first thing to say is that the relationship between the United Kingdom um, and India transcends whoever is in government. This is an important strategic relationship, uh, a history that goes back many, many generations, a deep people-to-people -people connection, as well as a business-to-business connection. Of course, I'm here with Jonathan to underline that. Of course, it's also the case that if there is to be a change of government and if we have the privilege to serve, it's important that we understand the views of our uh, Indian friends and business and industry and where the opportunities are to go forward. And the key message that I want to leave with people is that growth, growth, growth is our objective in the Labour Party if we have the privilege to serve and that we recognise that India, this huge powerhouse, growing economy, growing population, growth against a backdrop where other parts of the world and certainly in Europe are not seeing anything like the growth. There's key opportunities for us going forward. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're working on a trade deal, but that is the flaw of our relationship, not the ceiling. There's much more to do in the years ahead. That's really interesting because, of course, one Tory prime minister ago, we were told that the UK-India FTA would be in place by that Diwali. We've got, we passed those Diwalis. There's another one coming up. And uh, your leader, Keir Starmer, described it as a Kabi Kushi, Kabi Gum situation which in the UK, India, FTA. What do you see as the major hurdles and what would Labour do to actually fix that in case it's not signed uh, before the next election? Absolutely. Well, a lot of people have promised a trade deal by certain dates, but we are here partly because, as you say, the nature of an election in India and one in the UK means there is, I know, some, some worry about how that time scale may impact those negotiations. We've come to make clear that if the Labour Party does form the next government in the UK, this is something we support, that we would want to implement or continue those negotiations. Of course, for both sides, it's going to be a good deal. It's going to work commercially, but there are clearly areas where we can see the potential for that to be something very significant indeed and of course for the UK to be uh, oh, in a Which position. areas would you see those as? Well I think at the heart of that you've got the opportunity clearly as you'd expect to reduce tariffs in some certain uh, areas for, for textiles in India that is particularly significant. The one that's often given in the UK is of course uh, Scotch uh, whiskey but that's just one area where we can see that improved. Services access it is absolutely crucial. Now how we do that, that tends to be a harder part of negotiations but alongside that the investment treaty that's being discussed these are things that you really could now we don't want to go into shadow negotiations we're not part of that but i think we 
both recognise just what a significant opportunity this could be. But I want to reiterate what, what my colleague David has said, because people shouldn't think that we just want to finish this trade deal, get it done, significant as it would be, and that's the end. Mm -hmm. There are a whole range of further areas of collaboration. We've talked to people about technology, about defence, about what collaboration on the green transition might mean, not just for India and the UK, but for the rest of, of the world. You know, the collaboration that Absolutely. we could do together could really have such a positive and beneficial impact. And I, I find that personally very exciting. No, and in a sense, the India-UK relationship has changed. Uh, one aspect, of course, is that we overtake, overtook Great Britain to become uh, the world's fifth largest economy. We're aiming now for the third largest economy by 2030. How much do you think that's changed the way the two partners view each other, even negotiate with each other, and the fact that uh, geopolitically also, India has taken a much more vocal role as a leader of the Global South, as in asking for reform of multilateral institutions like the United Nations Security Council. Where do you see the new power balance, and where does the UK exactly stand in that then? Well, look, let me say I welcome the position that India finds itself in as one of the world's great large democracies. That is hugely, hugely important. Um, the levels of growth here, the growing burgeoning middle class, the gripping of education and skills, the dynamism of the economy are exemplary. And there's much to learn, I think, uh, as I come here. And I've now visited India on many, many occasions. And I remember one of my first trips 22 years ago as a young minister in Tony Blair's um, government, and the transition has been uh, immense. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just say, of course, uh, we support uh, India joining the UN Security Council alongside Germany, Japan, Brazil, uh, uh, and uh, Africa as well. Very, very important indeed. Um, the world is changing and multilateral partnership um, is essential. And in that sense, India remains and will continue to be a key partner uh, of the UK uh, and our allies. Mm -hmm. We have a long history. Uh, there's much that we can do together in a dangerous world. And I'm very pleased to be meeting with your foreign secretary uh, once again on this trip, but also to speak to your uh, national security as well about the issues of shared concern. I just wanted to bring up regarding foreign policy because, of course, uh, with Labour, and I think that, in a sense, did sour relations between uh, Labour and in the Indian uh, foreign ministry when uh, the Jeremy Corbyn had said at that, that time that he supports a, a proposal for an independent Kashmir. Now, of course, Keir Starmer has since corrected that. But do clarify for us what Labour's stand is on Kashmir. And also another sticking point uh, with uh, the UK and India has been the reaction to Khalistani protests last year at the Indian High Commission, and also the fact that the Sikhs for Justice routinely issues threats against Indian political leaders, and we feel that the UK response could have been stronger. What does Labour think well, on this? Well, let me reiterate uh, some fundamentals here. First, Keir, um, Jeremy Corbyn is not in the Labour Party um, any longer. We have had dramatic change um, since the 2019 election led by Keir Starmer, and that is important to emphasize. And that has put us in the position where, once again, we hope to have the privilege of serving uh, in a government. The second is to condemn entirely uh, the extremist and destructive behavior we saw in relation to the Indian High Commission um, uh, in London. Uh, I was pretty robust in my comments at the time, and I'm mm -hmm. happy to reiterate that again, we uh, absolutely have to have zero tolerance of any extremist uh, behavior, and that uh, uh, includes um, extremist uh, elements uh, of the Khalistani community, absolutely. But it's also to be clear that the vast majority uh, of Sikhs um, in our own country and here in India are peace-loving people. And it is to underline that the issues on Kashmir are complex, uh, 75 years old and beyond. They are centrally issues for uh, India, for Pakistan and the Kashmiri people. And we understand that uh, in the British Labour Party. Would you back, for instance, India has already uh, 
called SFJ terrorist organization. Would you call for stronger action against groups which call for assassination threats against Indian political leaders from UK soil? I have not got the intelligence as a member of the UK opposition, but I do condemn uh, entirely extremist behaviour from wherever it comes from. Mm -hmm. We have to be robust about that, whilst of course recognising uh, that Labour, the Labour Party is an internationalist party. It's a party that believes in human rights, um, uh, but we cannot have any truck with violence or extremism from wherever it's found. Uh, let me ask you, Mr. Reynolds, you talked about the services sector. And wh one thing I think which has bothered uh, many Indians is the fact that with Indians, uh, the mobility aspect, because of course you've seen Indian students are now amongst the highest international students uh, population in the United Kingdom, but we hear this anti-immigration rhetoric, which for many people borders on the racist, whether it uh, came from Suela Braverman or before that uh, the former Home Secretary. How is Labour going to actually combat that and what will your view be, given that immigration is such a political uh, hot button in the United UK elections? Well, look, I want everyone to know, we all want everyone to know how much we value the relationships between India and the UK, the fact that when you're here on a delegation, so many people tell you that they studied in the UK or they lived there for a while. What a tremendous basis for that strong relationship. And of course, whether it is people coming for higher education, whether it is Indian companies, uh, entrepreneurs investing in the UK, we fundamentally welcome that. Now, the UK has a points-based immigration system. It's a system that is designed to serve the best interests of the UK economy. And we're very comfortable talking about the benefits that that brings. It's you know, clearly one that has restrictions built into it. That's the nature of a points-based system. And I would, it would upset me if I thought that anyone thought that the UK wasn't welcoming that. And I hope people will see a different approach, can see the different approach that we bring from the Labour Party to that. Did you find that some of the recent rhetoric being used was racist? I think a lot of what we've seen from the Conservative government on immigration, how they've tackled the issue, how they fundamentally, I think, sent out a message that might be unwelcoming, is, is a challenge, is a problem. You know, and I think if I look to the, the future of where the UK can play a role in the global economy, that is very much to the interests of ourselves in the UK. It's through championing our strengths, championing the, the things that we're good at, and higher education is part of that. And we are just much more comfortable mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. Labour side in recognising that benefit. And I hope people can see the different change of tone and approach that we would bring to that. Of course, there have got to be limits on immigration, but that's what a points-based system is designed to do, to deserve the interest of your own economy. And I can say from complete sincerity that the relationship that that has meant for it, whether it's Indian students coming or Indian businesses coming to the UK, we see as an unreservedly positive and welcoming thing. Mm -hmm. We talked uh, we talk, uh, so often of multicultural Britain, and I think in that sense, Prime Minister Sunak uh, uh, being uh, becoming prime minister was seen as a cause of celebration in India as well. But how do you think Labour will? Because of course uh, we've seen that Labour's support amongst uh, the Indian community in Great Britain, the largest ethnic minority in Great Britain, has fallen dramatically. Uh, the, I think a 2019 poll showed it's now about 30 percent, almost half from what it was once at 60 percent. How would you combat a proud Hindu prime minister as uh, opposed to a Labour prime, prime minister? minister? Well, look, let me say that. I and the Labour Party also took great yes. comfort and pleasure um, in the election of Rishi Sunak um, as the first um, UK Prime Minister of Indian origin. And that's personal to me. Um, my family, my father arrived in the UK from Guyana in 1956. Uh, my mother's um, grandmother was from Calcutta. She arrived in Guyana as an indentured worker after the end uh, of slavery in the, in the century before last. So look, our, our history is immense and I'm, that's why it's always wonderful for me uh, to come back to um, India. You know, there's lots that I, that I the curries mm -hmm. is something that I've grown up with uh, all of my life. Um, look, I, 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 I think that the relationship between the UK uh, and India supersedes whoever is um, in number 10 or running 
um, uh, India, and I know you've got elections ahead, because it's an important relationship. It's an important partnership, uh, not just a win-win for our two economies, but for the global community. Um, uh, and so we will fight for every election, and there are areas uh, of the country, I'm thinking of Harrow and Brent, where there are historic um, uh, uh, I I I Indian um, uh, populations voting Labour, and we'll be fighting to encourage them to do that. That's why we're here uh, doing an interview with you. No, <laughs> and, and of course, I won't ask Mr. Reynolds because you're talking about greater business investment, but the uh, latest Labour attack on the Prime Minister has been about so called allegations of VIP access to Infosys. Now, given that Infosys is our biggest, one of our biggest software services providers, isn't it all for? counterproductive that when anything to do with Infosys is seen as Rishi Sunak's family getting preference or VIP access as the Labour puts it? Well, we do want to see greater business investment in the UK. We think that the link between our poor business investment at present under the Conservative Party relates to our poor productivity and that has come through in a very disappointing rate of growth now for quite some time. So all of our agenda is based on doing that and particularly obviously we want to attract inward investment to the UK to make that story Including a much better Including Infosys one. I guess. Well, Every company, whether it is from around the world, but obviously particularly because of the role of Indian investment in the UK, this is a really important thing to us. Now, all we want is that to be open, transparent, and available to everyone. So it's not about any one particular company, but there are concerns in the UK about what has been described as the VIP lane around you know, companies who are introduced around the pandemic. Surely, a healthy, robust system should be about open opportunities for everyone. That's why we're talking to everyone while we're here. We're telling them about opportunities in the energy transition, in the services sector, in professional and financial services. We want that to be open to everyone. That is all we ask and that is all we will put forward. But we are confident that our agenda is a better one for business investment in the UK. Though, of course, it does sometimes seem personal about uh, Mr. Sunak, because given that uh, Labour has also said that you want to abolish the non-dom tax, and that, of course, became a controversy around uh, his wife, Akshita, which she was later cleared of. So it does seem like it becomes a bit personal and political then. Well, look, our changes, our proposed changes to that particular tax regime, I'm not about one any individual person at all. We've made clear, our Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reeves, repeatedly says all we ask is if you have made the UK your home, you pay the appropriate amount of tax in the UK, that you should do. And of course, we recognise the the old-fashioned non-DOM regime, which we want to change, would need to be replaced by something where people in the UK for a short period of time would pay an appropriate level of taxation on their UK earnings, similar to every other country in the world. But people will know that the history of the non-DOM regime goes back a, a long time, really, to an era that is no longer appropriate. Mm -hmm. And there are concerns about a whole range of people making sure they are paying the right level of tax in the UK. All that policy is designed to do is to put that right, give people confidence that that is the regime we have. It is not targeted or based on any kind of political attack on anyone. It's about making sure we have a fair, robust and transparent process. And where people raise concerns about the overall level of taxation in the UK, we say we recognise that. The reason taxes are high by historic standards in the UK is that growth has been so low. So again, that comes back to our agenda about growth, about opportunity, about growing the economy and reducing that burden in future. Okay. So uh, you, you're here also, and we've got some other England guests here, the, England cricket, the English cricket team, and uh, we let them win one test match. But uh, are you following that? And what, what do you say about it? Because cricket, I mean, so there's some areas that are always sensitive, and cricket is one of them. Well, I, I grew up watching cricket. Uh, I grew up um, cheering also for the West Indies when they won, but watching great, great Indian cricket. I think most people thought that we uh, could not win in India this time. So good to see us win once test. But let's see it. Let's let's follow it and see see where we get to in the in the in the few weeks that are remaining. I can't profess much cricket knowledge, but coming from Greater Manchester, people might recognise our dominance on the footballing side. So there's a lot, of, a lot of interest in that wherever you go. Exactly. And just uh, as, as we're wrapping up, I mean, as I had made that point earlier about the timing. So the polls, at least, are showing uh, Labour well ahead at this point, but you've still got some months to go. And we know that a week is a long time in politics. How confident are you? Why do you think that, I mean, given that it's been 14 years out of power, why do you think that Labour is ready now? Well, look, we're not complacent. We can genuinely, it's not just words, we're genuinely not complacent. But I think, first of all, we can say, look at how the Labour Party has changed since 2019. We're a completely different proposition. The credit for that, in a big way, is down to Keir Starmer for having the courage to do that. And I think people recognise that case. Of course, 
politics always reflects a little bit on the other side and the fact is that there is a, a sense that this Conservative government has run out of, of energy, that there are major problems in public services and, and ultimately the economy and the changes that are required to that can't be delivered by the incumbent government. I would say on things like building enough homes in the UK, improving our relationship with the European Union. That is easier for an incoming government to do. And of course, things like our ambition on net zero and getting the economic mm. benefits to the UK for that chime very well with the public. But what we will do is not be complacent, but we'll, we'll take our role seriously. You know, we'll take that responsibility seriously. Being here in India is part of that. And of course, uh, a final question. We've got elections coming up soon. Uh, the Prime Minister just said that the BGP will cross a record 370, NDA 400 plus. So you're engaging with this government as the potential new government. How are you seeing it? I've been around in politics long enough to know uh, that in a great democracy like this, it is for the Indian people to decide uh, who they want to form um, uh, the government. It's a huge exercise to see millions of people going to the polls here in, in it's India. Huge. It's a huge message to the international community at this time. It's something that our both our countries share. We treasure that democratic um, uh, tradition. I want to see change in the UK. I wait to see what the Indian people decide in the weeks ahead. Thank you both so very much. Thank it you. was absolutely fantastic to meet well two men who are amongst the major thought leaders now of the new Labour Party. Thank you very much, David Lammy, Jonathan Reynolds, for being on the Dialogues. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Wonderful. I hope we start to time. Yes. Perfect.